that's a good sign that you are enjoying dinner and dessert. Thank you all. Hi, I'm Lisa Mensa. I'm uh, happy to serve as the board chair of the National Academy of Social Insurance, and it is always a great pleasure to be at our annual meeting. And you are in for a treat tonight. Not only is the dessert good, this is the real dessert, your evening speakers. Uh, so one of my joys as a board chair, this reminds me of my husband at our wedding who said, just let me show up and smile. So I get to do that, show up and smile, because this is, uh, there have really been many other hands at work uh, in producing this conference. And I really want to recognize our conference chairs again, Jean Sterley, Fernando Torres-Gill, and Janet Chiclis. Thank you so much for your work. And my partner in crime, the real worker of uh, the board, is, is Larry Atkins. Thank you, Larry, again. So I've had fun explaining who we are, uh, NASI, to our, to our dinner guests. And I think um, tonight is really a wonderful side of NASI. Yes, we're a wonderful academy of nearly 1,000 members. But in our mission statement, we really, we really set for ourselves this hard task of advancing solutions to the challenges facing the nation and increasing public understanding of social insurance and how it contributes to economic security. So I love that theme of advancing solutions and increasing public understanding of the very big foundational uh, social insurance programs. And one of the ways we do that is to come together annually, and this is our 25th conference, and it's been a winner. I think you'll agree so far. But we love to mix our love of PowerPoints and data and bibliographies with a little bit of time for dialogue. So uh, we were inspired to keep this a, a data-rich, uh, spin-free zone, but tonight, we are going to take a rest from the PowerPoints and have a wonderful uh, dialogue. Before we start, I have some real thank yous. Pulling off conferences in Washington is an expensive and complex business, and we couldn't do this without our supporters. Uh, two program underwriters are here today, Merck and AARP, so we have huge thanks for you all. And I want to mention a few of our roundtable underwriters. Uh, Kaiser Permanente Institute for Health Policy, the California Workers' Compensation Institute, and I'd like to also acknowledge and thank our top sponsors, Amerigroup, the California Healthcare Foundation, Express Scripts, the P Peterson Foundation, and not le last but not least, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So really, uh, thank you for all. So uh, my pleasure is to introduce our moderator tonight, and that's our, that is E.J. Dion, and E.J. Uh, is my neighbor. I sometimes uh, bump into him at the local pharmacy or at back to school night, and I'm usually, you know, eating something or being completely incompetent, and it's a great embarrassment. No, that's my role. <laughs> no. <laughs> but um, many of you have said how you've enjoyed E.J.'s uh, presence with us at, at prior uh, NASI events. He's the perfect person uh, to lead us in tonight's discussion. He is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. He is also a syndicated columnist for the Washington Post, a university professor uh, in the Foundations of Democracy and Culture, I love that, at Georgetown University. You will know him as a frequent commentator on all of our favorite uh, talking head uh, political shows. Uh, and, and from my notes here, I, I should note a couple of his wonderful books. This is a great title, Why Americans Hate Politics and uh, Our Divided Political Heart, The Battle for the American Idea in an Age of Discontent. Um, EJ, you've been named uh, one of our 25 most influential journalists. Uh, tonight, you're gonna help us understand our work on Social Security and Medicare, uh, bringing it uh, to discussion with uh, prominent pollsters. I'm going to let you introduce them. I'm going to get off the stage. Um, but our job is really to thank you, EJ, for, for doing this and helping us construct tonight. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank
thank you very much. I, I don't know if anybody wants to take responsibility for being one of the 25 most influential uh, journalists, given the way people feel about uh, journalism. Um, it's a real honor to be here today. I have learned a lot from so many of the uh, people in this room. I've learned so much that I try as often as possible to use the words social insurance rather than the word entitlement. Uh, when, <laughs> and uh, the, um, and um, I would, um, and I actually am going to ask our pollsters here, it's going to be a kind of uh, image analysis of your group as to why the word social insurance uh, is not out there uh, more prominently. Uh, but for me, it's a real pleasure also because these are two folks I talk to all the time, voluntarily, whenever I can. Um, they're two of my very favorite pollsters, and I say that behind their backs. Um, Anna, I talk to all the time. Anna and I, as you probably know, are somewhat closer in our politics than David and I. So I talk to Anna to sound a whole lot smarter than I deserve to in my own views. And David and I regularly get together to see which one of us is going off the rails faster. Uh, and I have found him, well, I'm sorry. I seem to be winning that at the moment, right? <laughs> and uh, I have found him an incredibly uh, honest uh, and, and really sort of self-reflective uh, person. One of the harshest things ever said of David is that he is a solutionist. Someone actually said that as a criticism of David. <laughs> and that's, of course, one of the reasons I like him. Um, uh, Anna has, uh, got, a, has, got a PhD from the University of Chicago. Um, she taught at the uh, Kennedy School. Uh, and then she decided that, to, that the family business drew her uh, back in. And Anna's had an awesome list of clients to list just a few, uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, Gab whom David I know admires very much, actually. Um, that's true. Uh, Gabby Giffords, uh, Mark Dayton, she's worked for Emily's List, a number of labor unions, uh, NARAL, and lots and lots of other people. Um, she has done a lot of work over the years on um, uh, the attitudes of women, on young people, uh, on uh, the, re the religious, particularly the religious behavior of young people. Um, so if you're a young religious woman, she knows everything about you. <laughs> or if you're a young anti-religious woman, she knows everything about you. Um, David has had an amazing uh, list of clients. Um, I will list only a few. David, by the way, got started in politics. Uh, this is his link to an old-fashioned kind of republicanism. Herb Brownell, a name some of you remember, who was Dwight Eisenhower's attorney general, got David interested in politics when he was a kid, and that's how he ended up being uh, a Republican pollster. Uh, he worked uh, for Newt Gingrich in the Q&A. You can ask him about that experience. Um, he works, he's worked for both the Republican Senate Conference and the Republican House Conference. He is now uh, an advisor to John Boehner. Uh, he gave a major presentation at the Republican retreat, and I'm sure he'll share every detail uh, with us tonight <laughs> of what he told uh, the Republicans. Um, he also works for the Gates Foundation, uh, and therefore recently built a mansion in Hawaii. No, that's not true. <laughs> um, the, uh, what I'd just like to do uh, to start off is to have you talk um, um, in general about the last election and uh, sort of what table did that, s that election set uh, for us now. Um, and if you could sort of give your general views of that election and then move into um, how in particular you think that dialogue, and I'll have some more questions on that, um, affected our discussions of social insurance programs on Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, and others. That would be great. But, uh, you know, you guys have spent more time looking at more numbers than most people for the last uh, 12, 13 months. So if you could share uh, some of your wisdom, let me start with uh, Anna. I, I could say Anna's the winning side, except he held the house, although we can argue about how. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> so can you clarify when you say on this issue specifically, or just in... Well, I'd like, I, I think it would be useful, the, you know, your kind of short answer to why did this turn out as it did. I just think okay. your views on that okay. are useful for everybody, okay. and then we can move into the right. so, social... So insurance. I just did, for the first time, I was an expert witness at a trial, and I was cross-examined yesterday, and I learned always to ask a clarifying question rather than <laughs> give an answer if you're not entirely sure what it is they're asking. Yes, the indictment well, is to, in to my To the pocket, aggravation of this attorney who is... A, cross-examining me. Um, okay. I'm your friend. That's what the <laughs> But of course, that's what a lot of attorneys say, you know, but. <laughs> um, okay. 
I think it's a really complicated question you're asking because on the one hand, there's a narrative about this election that you know, Obama won, um, Democrats picked up seats in the House, picked up seats in the Senate, and so you could sort of, and it was a base election so that while, and turnout is a big part of why Obama won and we won you know, as many races as we did in the House and did as well as we did in the Senate, and there's some individual stories, you know, individual Senate races where the candidates were part of the story and it wasn't just sort of the overall environment. Um, but I think it's, and you could even say, okay, well, there's sort of a mandate, uh, even though the Republicans kept the House because the, you know, the Democrats netted seats. And moreover, coming out of the election, the Republican brand is very poor. We just did a national study um, released about a week and a half ago, and we have a big part of it's about the Republican brand, and David can talk more about that if he wants to. <laughs> but at any rate, it's not very, I'm not, by the way, the Democratic brand's not much better, but it is better than their, their you know, we're down by, you know, 12 points and they're down by 25 in terms of, you know, image. Um, so you could come out of it thinking, okay, there's at least some kind of mandate for Democrats, a mandate for Obama. But the question is, what is that mandate? And I think that's really complicated. Certainly, I think on social issues, whether it's marriage equality or women's issues, broadly defined, reproductive health more narrowly, on a whole range of those kinds of, even immigration to the degree that's a cultural issue, I actually think there's a big mandate for a sort of more liberal perspective, if you will. And I think you heard that in the, um, the inauguration speech the president gave. But I think on economic issues, on budget, on taxes, um, not taxes narrowly as we the deal that they did at the end, in the, in the, at, after the election, but I think going forward, what's possible. I think things are a lot more contested than they are, and I think that that's because at the presidential level, I don't think there was a full-throated debate about the budget deficit, about what the role of Social Security and Medicare is in that. You saw it at the, um, in the House and Senate races, and in the House races I was involved in, I mean, if you look at the special election, Ron Barber, Jesse Kelly, to replace Gabby Giffords, about 75% of the ads were about Ron Barber cut, you know, $750 million, billion dollars from Medicare. Jesse Kelly says Social Security is a Ponzi scheme, and that entire campaign was about Social Security and Medicare, going back and forth on who would be better on it. And that's probably an extreme example, in part because Jesse Kelly said some things that were, you know, on TV that were very easy to use, and some of the other people we'd run against didn't give us as much fodder. So it was very well played out at, at that level, but at the presidential, it really wasn't. And it was, in fact, I think the moment where I felt sort of most depressed during that first presidential debate was when Obama said, I think Mitt Romney and I agree on Social Security. <laughs> what? Right? Yeah. So I, I sort of, uh, so at any rate, I, I feel that there's some areas that were almost settled. I mean, I think, you know, gay rights was like settled by this election, pretty much. I mean, there's going to be some vestiges of, in different states, and different, but I think it's kind of settled as a national narrative. But, but I think that this whole question of the budget, of spending, of taxes, and, and in particular the place of social insurance in that conversation is sort of unsettled. And I don't know that either side has a big advantage in the configuration we see right now in Washington. There's no doubt if you look at public opinion, if you ask people, should we cut Social Security and Medicare to balance the budget, 85% say no. And most of the solutions that people favor around reform are doing things like raising uh, the cap on Social Security taxes or kind of means testing Medicare for, you know, wealthier seniors, things that actually are kind of progressive solutions <laughs> to, um, if to the degree that people believe there's actually a problem with the programs, at least, you know, Medicare anyway. Um, so I, if, if in public opinion, I think people feel very, are very clear about where they are on the role of these programs in their lives, but I think in Washington, the election didn't settle it, and I think that it's, it's not clear who's going to sort of, I think, win that, that fight. Thank you. David. Well, um, actually, I agree with Anna that, that w one of the problems, at least on the Republican side, and you've seen this um, sort of evolve as the debt ceiling debate has emerged, is um, that sort of full-throated debate that should have occurred in terms of the economy didn't, in terms of the fall election. The reason it didn't was because on the Republican side, there was this sense of, well, this president's in so much trouble, we really don't need to say anything, it's a, it's a referendum, right? Um, which was a huge strategic error at, at, at a remarkable scale. Um, and, and to just give you a sense of this, um, and, and not to sound partisan in, in terms of the numbers, but I mean, the, the economy over the past four years, for whatever reason, um, has certainly been pretty grim. I mean, when you take a look at, there have been 43 months of 8% or more unemployment. That's more than the 11 previous administrations combined. You've had deficits over a quarter, a one and a quarter trillion, when prior to that, the largest had been at 468 billion, economic growth under 2%. Um, yet on election day, the president wins despite that. And when you actually take a look at the exit polls, when you ask who do you have more confidence to handle the economy, it's basically even between the two. So when you think about it, so people were looking at, okay, here's the president's record. Again, 43 months, 8% unemployment, no economic growth, huge deficits. 
and the perception of whatever Governor Romney's plan was, and basically the public said, oh, that's about even. The expectation that that is not a good, I mean, that was not a good outcome. And that was the result of, of running a referendum campaign. And ultimately what the president was able to do very effectively um, was to paint Governor Romney as being just extending the policies of George Bush. Um, and, when, and when you take a look at the exit polls, by a 53 to 38 margin, people thought that the economic problems of this country laid more so with, with uh, President Bush than with President Obama. And when you actually take a look at those two voter groups, that 53% and that 38%, they almost, they behaved almost at the same levels as partisans would. That you saw 85%, I believe it was 85% of those people who blamed Bush voted for Obama. Um, 90, over 90% of the people who blamed Obama voted for Romney. So that was sort of the de 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 defining moment in terms of what the president was able to effectively do was create this choice when, in fact, um, the, the Romney team was trying to do a referendum. So, uh, so in terms of moving forward at this point, what you see Republicans dealing with is there was no economic argument made. And to some degree, the president is able to go out and try to assert, um, in fact, that, that, that he has this mandate. Um, and at least what you're watching now is this dynamic of Republicans saying, no, actually, that wasn't a mandate. And so you're sort of going back and forth. And so, so that's the dynamic as it sort of exists. And as we go forward over the next two years, clearly what's going to occur here is this, there's going to be this huge fight in terms of how do we begin to move back toward um, a balanced budget uh, and some level of fiscal responsibility. And what you're going to see is two, two arguments within that. Um, one clearly impacting here in terms of, so what do you do with entitlements? I mean, that, that's, that's the big chunk of the budget. How do you manage that? How do you begin to get that under control? That's one piece. The other piece of this um, that, that is beginning to emerge is, so what is the argument around economic growth, right? The more economic growth you have, then the less pressure there is potentially longer term entitlements, but how do you balance that out? And I think one of the dynamics as, as we move forward is, is, in fact, how do you get to that point in terms of talking about that economic growth? Um, on the Republican side, I think what you saw was a very different shift. Um, a, there was a sense here that Republicans were going to, at every single point in the way, try to, in fact, engage you know, the debt ceiling. Okay, there was going to be a fight over that. Then you were going to have this, the uh, um, sequester. There was going to be a fight over that. What I think you've now seen is, um, at least from the House Republicans, is a sense of looking at it in sort of longer term, broader term, um, which I think will allow for some more flexibility in terms of dealing with some of these issues. But having said that, I mean, the, looking at the debt at the scale of it, of it is, um, but let me go back to, to one thing that I think is critically important. When we balanced the budget um, back in the late 90s, um, the pro what really occurred, um, having been there, I was Newt's direct, uh, uh, director of planning at that point, um, what was really nice was just the economy just really took off and there was a lot of revenue coming in and uh, all of a sudden here we had, uh, we were in the black. Um, and, and after 97, and I would attribute this, and EJ will argue with me, and it's all Anna in terms of 97 tax cuts in terms of cap gains, but you can argue with me on that. Um, but we, after that point, you had four years of balanced budget, four years of 4% growth, and we finally got under 4% unemployment. Let me tell you, the best way to balance the budget or move toward ba a balanced budget, have unemployment under 4%, that's a great first step. Well, in fact, that, I, I want to get to that uh, because one of the things I find astonishing about the current debate is everyone is talking about cutting and cutting and cutting when the economy is still not out of the doldrums yet. And it, it seems the timing issue doesn't come up at all. But I wanted to, just one thing that we talked about a lot, David, at the time, as everybody, a lot of social scientists in this room, you all know that if you ask the wrong question, you can't possibly get the right answer. And I was always intrigued by the three-way phrase, a framing of the question, because David told me this early on, and it struck me as one of the best critiques I had heard about the nature of the Republican campaign that was being run. You know the question I'm yeah. talking about. Uh, you, yeah. Okay. And what it was, it, it, you had three groups in terms of people, how they were view, viewing the economy. You had one group who said that, um, that things were just awful, the progress was completely unacceptable. Then you had another group who said, no, things are going great, this is fine, this is the direction we wanted to go. Then you had a third group who was actually the overwhelming, the largest group, and that was, we're not happy with the direction, we, we, th we think the economy's improving, but we're not happy with how things are going. And so they were confused. And actually, if you take a look in terms of the exit polls, 45% um, of the country said that they thought the economy was not so good. Okay, you would think that would be the perfect audience for Governor Romney, right? I mean, that he should have done incredibly well. Uh, the president won him 55 to 42, a 13-point margin. That's larger 
that's larger than his overall margin. And that shows you, again, the, the dynamic and reflective of the, the particular question that we were talking about earlier. Um, what the president was able to do was sort of define things, and, and, and Governor Romney decided it was going to be a referendum. Um, and sorry, something does beat nothing. Uh, up on that. One of the things that I felt like the Romney campaign missed in trying to make the election a referendum on Obama's handling of the economy was not just um, at a in a sort of static way. What, you know, if you say well, how, how's the economy doing or how are we, you know, how's, what's the direction of the country? Very bad numbers. But if you ask, is the economy at its bottom and getting better? Is it has it not bottomed out yet, or is it doing well? The number who said it's bottomed out and getting better kept rising over the course of 2012. Yeah. Steadily, and you know why? Because the economy was doing a little better. No doubt, if you just talk about the numbers, like the unemployment rate, you know, it's not a strong economy. But there, are, people, voters were persuaded that it was getting better, and that was as important as objectively where the economy actually was. I'm going to slightly argue with you on that. And from this point, of view, one of the things that just struck me as completely bizarre in terms of the Republican convention was the phrase that "Were you better off than you were four years ago?" Four years ago, we were losing six to eight hundred thousand jobs a month. <laughs> so yeah. and it's like, so yes, are we, we are, are we are we better off than that? Uh, the answer would be yes. yes. And so 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 okay. This is this is you know I've, I've I've like had this little thought in my mind is had we not posed that question, which caused people to go, yeah, we are better, <laughs> right? What would have actually happened? Maybe people would have gone like, okay, we're not doing that because let me let me go back to sorry to, and to be a Boehner person here. Um, one of the things that we tried to do in 2010 was not do that question. What we tried to do was ask a contemporary question. Here are all these things going on, and what's the outcome everybody's looking for? Well, we wanted, we wanted jobs, right? And so the question was, where are the jobs? It was intended to be a contemporary question, as opposed to, where were you four years ago? Mm -hmm. We managed to pick, seriously, we managed to pick the one moment that would create the singular, most favorable contrast for the president. I just, it just irks me, anyway. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> let, me, let me go to the, I, wa I want to go particularly to Medicare because it strikes me that if you follow the narrative of the campaign, um, this campaign was far more a mandate to spend more on Medicare than less because you had, on the one hand, Mitt Romney uh, attacking Barack Obama for cutting Medicare as part of the Affordable Care Act, and then you had Obama attacking Romney for favoring cuts in Medicare in his own budget and the Paul Ryan budget. Mm -hmm. And no one was campaigning on, we really need to cut these entitlement programs. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what, we are, so the notion that there is any mandate for any of these cuts just strikes me as, as kind of absurd, there, given there, what both candidates said. I'd love you both no, there, to there talk no about mandate. that. There is no mandate. There is no mandate <laughs> for cutting these programs. There are, and, and moreover, I don't think that people are persuaded, particularly in the case of Social Security, that there's a problem with these programs. And when people think there's a problem with the deficit, but they don't think that the way to deal with the deficit is to cut these programs. People think they should be strengthened. There is absolutely, and, and it's not just, by the way, what happened presidentially. And I go back to what happened in these House and Senate races. Americans for Prosperity and Freedom Works and all of these right-wing super PACs all of whom, I'm sure, hate the social insurance programs, were running ads attacking us for cutting Medicare by $750 billion. I mean, the irony is really kind of stunning. Um, the problem, I think, is that I don't think the presidential campaign, on our side anyway, ever really, I, I don't think they ever really engaged the debate. It was very superficial. If you looked at the content of the advertising, it didn't, they didn't, the actual paid ads in the battleground states didn't talk about Medicare and Social Security very much. There was far more on women's health, for example. Not that I have a problem with that, but um, but these are ratio of when you think about what, you know, in terms of the the problem we have now. And I think the president himself wants to be somebody who has, is a solutionist, um, and is has been open, has shown himself to be open at, on many many occasions to cuts to social insurance programs. And that may be why it was not a bigger, made a bigger deal by his campaign. But it, at the time, it struck many of us as a missed opportunity to define the debate coming into 2013. Could I put a, a point on this question for you, David? Because if, first of all, you know, if you agree with what I said, which you might not, um, mm -hmm. but I, it strikes me that there is something to learn from the Gingrich experience because 
when the Republicans cut Medicare, or as you like to put it at the time, cut the growth of uh, Medicare, um, <laughs> there had been no predicate for that laid uh, in the uh, 94 election. And then when President Bush proposed to privatize social, partly privatize Social Security, he did mention it in the campaign, mm -hmm. but had clearly not made it a central pillar. But I, I always thought Gingrich got in particular, and the Republican Congress got in particular trouble about that because there had been no kind of warning or signaling to the voters in advance. So then and now, if you could. Uh, I mean, in terms of, of both these programs, I mean, and, and, and you go to a very good point. Um, and this is one, I, one of the troubling elements I, I view in terms of campaigns because campaigns are so remarkably negatively focused, okay? The Washington Post did a story, there's what, $1 billion spent on behalf of both these candidates. Um, Governor Romney, of the money that he spent or was spent on his behalf, 91% was negative. Um, in terms of the president, 85% was negative. So it's really hard to advocate a direction when the whole point is why the other person is so bad. And so one of the elements that, 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 I've, come, that I've come across, at least in terms of looking at these two specific issues and how the public was responding to them, um, Look, I did a question, you believe or not believe that, pre that the President Obama's health care plan strengthened Medicare? 40% believe, 54% don't believe. Okay, we'd say, well, from a Republican point, that's an, that's an awesome number. Except the fact is, there's got to be some alternative in place. And what, what's basically happened and where the electorate's at at this point is they're looking at what they're hearing from both sides, and they have not found a satisfactory solution at this point. And there's an opportunity for both parties there to sort of come up with that. Um, although I would suggest that the political side of both parties are sort of unwilling because they are so scared in terms of actually beginning to try to lay out some solution because of what the potential political consequences are, we haven't gotten there. But could it be that there is no solution if, if the solution you have in mind involves some long-term cuts to Social Security and Medicare, there is no solution you can put on the table that will actually be popular? You know, it, it's a funny thing, and I'm sure Anne has seen the same thing. You know, you, you pose this question in terms of, um, and I do this, you know, so do you think you should do across the board cuts, right? Right. And you get 70% say, yes, we should have across the board cuts. And then you sort of outline a couple of them, and they're like, well, maybe not those, right? <laughs> maybe, you know, okay, yeah, I'm for the 70%, but maybe not those. And, and, and for a while, I've been sort of struggling with that, okay, I mean, people understand that obviously something has to occur here. And so you can't say no to every single cut because you got, I mean, if you're four across the, eventually at some point, and, and here's, here's sort of my theory at the moment, okay, and I will grant you it's a theory. Um, and that is, I, I think the sense is people are willing to do really tough things, except that they don't believe that it's going to get to the goal that we'll do all these cuts, and then we'll find ourselves exactly in the same situation. Everybody's gone through all that pain, and we still have the same problem. And what they don't have the confidence in is that if we do this, in fact, we'll get to the solution, they think we'll just be in the same mess again. I absolutely think there are solutions, and I think that it, it's not complicated. I mean, if you look narrowly at the programs, not in the context of the deficit, but at the programs, again, it's not clear that Social Security actually, there is a problem. Um, but there is certainly is a belief among younger generations that it won't be around when, when they uh, get older. And there is a, obviously an issue with healthcare costs as it affects Medicare. But as I said earlier, when you go through a range of different solutions to the alleged or you know, real problems of these programs, people actually favor progressive solutions, right? Which is to expand the pool of people who pay into them, um, which would actually go a long way toward solving some of the, the long-term issues. If you put it in the context of the deficit, People want a balanced approach. Nobody has a problem with more revenue. No one. OK, a few Republicans have. But most people <laughs> don't have a problem with more revenue, whether that takes the form of increasing taxes on the wealthy, which is something that's been popular for a long, long time. And certainly, if there was kind of a mandate coming out of the presidential election, certainly the president believed he had one. And while I don't love what happened in December, it certainly was a much more progressive solution than you might have imagined we could have had before that election. And then if you look at the kinds of um, opportunities, I don't think there's any more new revenue necessarily on the table in the sense of raising rates. But there are all kinds of, if, you know, and it's very, I know it sounds like rhetoric, but there are all kinds of corporate loopholes. And you know, the vast majority of people favor closing them. So I think it's this, what I don't like about where this is going, and I, I think that Democrats are part of the problem too, is it becomes this trade-off between you know, budget deficit or, you know, or the social, you know, insurance programs, when there's a whole other area here of new revenue 
that's not going to come out of the pockets of any individual, but it's going to come out of the pockets of you know GE who got money back, let alone didn't pay any taxes. You know, whenever what year it was, they actually got a rebate of ta taxes they didn't pay. Um, but I feel like the debate is going in this direction of it's a it's a trade-off, and I think it's a false choice. I, I find it very frustrating. <laughs> well, when will we ever get to the point where? it will be possible for a politician to propose a general tax increase. In other words, it's, the one, I think one can argue that the, unless you are uh, you know, a libertarian who really wants to just slash the government, mm -hmm. to do the things most mm -hmm. people seem to want the government to do mm -hmm. over the long run, uh, even if we do a reasonably good, better job of cutting healthcare costs, you can't repeal the aging of the baby boom much as I wish you could. Um, and so at some point, uh, there may come a time when we can close some loopholes, we can probably get some more out of the well off, and so on. Um, if you want to do something, there may be come a time for a general tax increase. Is that ever possible? I, I may know what your answer is, but maybe you'll surprise me. Um, or would it be possible connected to some specific set of programs? You know, dedicated to healthcare, for example, or something else. I'm just curious whether we will see a day when it will ever be safe for a politician to say, everybody's taxes have to go up a little bit. I, I think there are two issues. One is, how does government work? And the notion that the skepticism people have about government. And I think Democrats, you know, and I've been in a number of rooms with progressives where I talk about government reform, and they're, no, no, we don't talk about government reform because that sounds like you're anti-government. I said, no, I'm, I'm for government working better and doing a better job with taxpayer dollars. What's, what, what's anti-government or not populist or progressive about that? Like, I don't quite understand that. So there's resistance, I think, on the progressive side around acknowledging that, you know, government could work a lot better and that people could have a lot more faith in, in what it does. So I think that's kind of a problem for progressives around asking for higher taxes. But the other piece, which is in some ways more difficult, is that if you look at the structural changes in our economy and the kind of economic pressures most people who aren't rich are under, and you look at how the states have dealt with yeah. their um, budgets and how taxes have devolved to some fairly regressive um, and onerous forms of taxation, I think a lot of people are quite uh, reasonable and saying that they can't afford and don't want to pay more taxes. When you think about leaving, we always, when we think about taxes, we're always thinking about federal income taxes and, and FICA. But, yeah. but if you think about property taxes and sales taxes and the, and the way that some of these governors have, you know, used all these gimmicks around fees that are a tax, right? And again, a lot of them are regressive. And so I think there's a legitimate complaint on the part of, you know, middle income and lower income folks around really not actually being able to afford a lot more in taxes because of the way our economy has changed and the way people are struggling um, to keep up. So until we can sort of figure that issue out, which is obviously a huge long term, and it's not like any one person can figure it out, it strikes me as very difficult. Yeah, the, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities had a good report this week on the regressivity of state and local taxes. And it's a big problem. But it seems like you can't even no one's been willing to propose tax increases on people earning over $100,000 a year. In other words, I accept your point that A, these people have been hammered, B, they are getting hammered fiscally in other ways, and yet it's still, it's, there's been reluctance to go even as, you know, even down to 100,000 bucks. What's your answer to this question? Well, this is, this is where EJ and I definitely have a disagreement. Um, and, and, and that is two elements. I mean, one, I, I guess looking at it from the point of view Tax rates and tax revenues are two very separate things, right? Again, tending to look at it from the point of view, you set tax rates to maximize economic activity, and it's the economic activity that, in fact, generates the revenues that you're looking for. He told me he was going to channel Jack Kemp tonight. Right, I know. <laughs> so, 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 so starting off with a very Kempian start there. Um, but, and I'm going to give you a number that's going to surprise you. And listen, I've, I've, I've done this to the, to the House Republican Conference, and they've been surprised by this number when I laid it out to them. But, he, but here's an interesting number. In 2003, right, the, the second round of the Bush tax cuts, right, to 2007, what happened to revenues over that four-year period? They went up $800 billion, the largest single increase in revenues that we've ever seen in the history of the country, $800 billion. By the way, the deficit went from $370 billion in, two, in, in 2003 to $161 billion and was actually on its way to being balanced until the housing crisis hit. 
right? And so, so one, one, of the one of the dynamics here, at least in terms of how Republicans tend to view, some Republicans tend to view this as the, as the key here is, it is not the tax rate that matters. It's the economic activity that you can generate. J.C. Watts had this wonderful line that the, the, the goal here isn't to create more taxes, it's to create more taxpayers. And to some degree, what, what happened at the, end of, at the end of the 1990s was when the unemployment rate dropped below 4%. The, I just completely over, I mean, I remember, again, like I was saying before, you know, sitting in the speaker's office and all of a sudden we get these reports back in terms of CBO estimations in terms of revenue and we had balanced the budget, right? And to a large degree, the reason was because America was working. And so I would suggest that it, it's not so much raising revenue, r raising tax rates to generate revenue. How do you maximize that? So how do you help small businesses? Going, going to one last number. Um, one of the things um, that in terms of where you saw the speaker and the House Republicans talking about in terms of the concern about small business, um, by raising tax rates amongst, uh, in terms of those making over 250,000, those people are, who are, who are uh, chapter S's and, C, and, corp, and uh, C's, um, how many businesses are you talking about? 894,000 small businesses. And that's not me, that was, um, oh, Urban Institute of Brookings, um, tax policy. So. Joint tax. Um, that was their number. Um, and so part of, part of the problem here, and there's a real, and I will tell you, if, they, if there's one serious, real disagreement in terms of the two parties, that debate is one of the structural ones. Well, of course, a lot of those aren't small businesses, but we can have that argument another day. The, um, but I, I think the headline, by the way, is Republican pollster praises Clinton economic record. No. Uh, and the, and yes, Clinton and Gingrich, Gingrich economic Clinton record. Gingrich yes, economic economic policy. record. Let me ask about the word entitlements. Do you poll on it? What, does, uh, what do people think? I, I, I think entitlements is a terrible word because most people think entitlements are what other people feel they're entitled to and uh, programs that are called entitlements are the things I'm entitled to and therefore they're not entitlements. I mean, there's an odd logic to the word entitlement. What, have I you never use, ever I done never any work? I, I, always, I know. I always yeah. use specifically Social Security and. Medicare and unemployment benefits. I've never, I would never use the word entitlement. Right. Have you ever sort of studied it or what its impact no, is? No, because I would never use it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me. To, you know, it sort of seems like Frank Luntz came up with it. Well. It does. It seems like one of those, you know, one of those words that they focus grouped and found some way of talking about something that everybody pay, pays into <laughs> and gets back <laughs> as part of the social contract and made it into like welfare. That's what it feels like to me when. To use that word. Entitlements is a long four-letter word. Is what you're saying. <laughs> yes. Have you uh, done? Have you done any work on uh, on sort of language and and people's perceptions of what these things are? Not language. I, again, I'm, language is one thing. Ideas and sort of the construct around them. Here, here's, I'm, not, I'm not making you frank. No, no, no. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Here, here's here, here, and I and I think obviously this got surfaced to a large degree because of the 47 percent comment, right? And, and I and I think there's. There's a dynamic here in terms of how people look at programs and, and what their role is. Okay, so my, my suggestion, and I'm going to do the Kemp line in terms of, of, of the 47%, don't mean to pick on, on Anna here, but um, that, that Jack Kemp's line was in, that um, Democrats judge their success by how many people government can help, right? And Republicans judge their success by how many people government doesn't have to help. Having said that, what's implied in that is, however, there is a safety net. And I think to some degree, it's not necessarily entitlements, it's the structure in place that allows people to say, this is the way this country should operate. And what should that look like? Now, having said that, there's a clear fight in terms of what that means, and there's a difference in terms of the two parties in terms of how you address that. Um, Republicans are clearly for making sure that there is an effective net in place so that people can have those opportunities. Having said that, there's a disagreement in terms of how far that should go and what it should look like. That may be true, I, but I saw no evidence, certainly in this last campaign, either from Mitt Romney or the Republicans I was running against, that there was interest in the social safety net. And I would, I would just, you know, I know that Jack Kemp's characterization is a Republican characterization of the Democratic Party as a way to. I didn't say it was well, I'm just saying it's not. I mean, whatever, it's not yeah. worth. It's not even worth. But I would. Want, I do not feel, and I think that when you look at the question of who's for average people, who is, it is true if you look at the exit polls that people were divided on who would do a better job on the economy and job creation. But if you asked who was for the middle class, who cares about people like you, on all of those kinds of questions, and this came from plenty of people who were not black or Hispanic <laughs> as well, people thought the Democratic Party 
did, or Barack Obama did. And I think that's because I think the Republican Party was crystal clear in this election about the fact that they actually don't care about a social safety net. And I think that that was way farther than even some of the most kind of anti-government voters are. And, and here's what I, I would disagree in the sense of, since this is a referendum, the argument was never engaged. We've got to get beyond the presidential level. A lot happened at the Senate and congressional level, too. There was a lot of communication going on. And there's been a lot of communication going on at the state level about what's happening in state, in, in state legislatures and in state houses. I mean, the presidential election at a certain point was, was baked at a certain point. It didn't uh, change at all except for a couple of moments. The, no, I, I do think just in terms of looking at the numbers, the, it's, it, it, it's been a while since the Republican numbers in terms of being a party of the rich has, have been as bad as they were uh, in this election. I, I mean, I don't think you disagree with that, right? Well, but, but let's talk about the two specific programs you're talking about, Social Security and Medicare. Yeah, what's the one group um, that you saw uh, Romney do better than McCain, 65 plus. And in fact, when you take a look going from 2006, when we lost the majority, we were basically split 65 plus, zero, there was no difference. In 2010, when we won the majority, we won 65 plus by 21. So right, but obviously but there must seniors, be something in place that seniors were saying, hey, we're yeah, going the Republican way. But Obama way. did badly with seniors in 2008. There's a ra an issue of race here that I think is also part of the story with white seniors. And if you look throughout the entire four years, his worst group was always white seniors. So the idea that it, you know, obviously, you know, on this debate about Social Security, Medicare, what, you know, the seniors were fine with Republicans. I don't, I, I don't think you can draw that conclusion or make that draw that line. There was a lot going on with seniors besides this debate. Yeah, I also think that this generation. I mean, it's cohort analysis, mm -hmm. and that the New Deal seniors who passed to their eternal reward, and that this was already a more conservative and Republican group. This group, this crop seniors. of seniors, but, and they are less uh, African American and Latino than younger mm -hmm. voters are. That's just a fact. But, but thing. I, and let's <coughs> take let's take the president out of it. And so let's go from 2006 to 2010. How do Republicans go from zero, being even amongst 65 plus to plus 21? The president wasn't part of that. 2010 was overdetermined. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll ask one last question. I want to open it up to the audience. I can't resist, and maybe there's no useful data on this. Um, <clears throat> I was drawn, I gave a talk to this group some years ago about the idea of social insurance, and I've always liked this idea because I think it actually captures what these programs are fundamentally, and not just Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Um, and yet, th this term, this concept, I think if you ask somebody what is social insurance, uh, you would probably get a lot of blank stares. Mm -hmm. um, is there, it, it, can you talk a little bit about that or even the idea of insurance? Because I think the, even viewing the sort of the welfare state as a form of insurance is quite different than if you call it the welfare state. I think that's true. I don't, but I don't necessarily have an answer for you about why rhetorically we don't talk about it that way. Because it's not just, as you say, it's not just these two programs. I mean, everybody pl pays unemployment taxes. In case they, and then when you get your unemployment benefits, it's not welfare, you actually paid. And your employer has paid into the unemployment, uh, whatever it is. Uh, I don't even know how you get unemployment benefits. But so, um, and I think if you look back at the progressive era and the New Deal, that's the way a lot of these programs were, were thought about. But I don't know why that's, you know, rhetorically that's where we are. You have any further thoughts on that? No, because you posed the question like, where did the word entitlements come from? And, and, and I have to say that that's an intriguing question in terms of like, how did it get phrased that way? And it's clearly the term of art at this point. I mean, everybody talks about we have to get entitlements under control. Um, and it's, it's clearly become a term of art. That, but, but again, this goes back to, and I, and I think this is a structural perception problem that if in fact these programs are going to sort of resolve themselves in such a way is, is are they viewed as entitlements in the sense of like this is just what people are owed or is the sense of there is some, going to your point, that it's some sort of social insurance. Um, and I would suggest to you probably at this point that it leans more toward the entitlement side. Having said that, but once anybody talks about cutting them, oops. Right. <laughs> but can I just say that saying that, that the consensus that entitlement programs are out of control just strikes me as not a, pro I mean for a progressive and for a, that is not a helpful frame uh, for people who care about these programs. Oh, because, I, and, and, but I think it's been widely accepted by both parties, but 
I mean, you, what you could really say is healthcare costs are out of control, yeah. right? And we have a huge aging population, but the notion that these programs are out of control is, I think, very much a Republican frame that's been accepted by many people in Washington anyway. I, I think it is. And one I, of, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think it is one of the great sort of. It's a kind of debate. It's it's sort of battle of frames, but it's also a debate. You describe it as all these programs are out of control, or it's healthcare costs. And right. I actually think that that issue has been joined more mm -hmm. directly in the last couple of years than it had been before. But but still, the bottom line is you have two programs, right, that are increasing at a scale that the country can't afford. And and people do understand that if things continue the way they are, two-thirds of the country recognizes this is not a sustainable situation. Now, having said that, what's the solution, right? And again, you have a vari variety of different views on that. But basically, there's a belief by two-thirds of the country that this is not sustainable. Now, I want to open it up to questions. I didn't ask any of the fun questions like, is Hillary going to run? What do you make of Chris Christie? Or any of that. So I want to leave that. I didn't want it with this learned audience to be the person who asked those questions. So certainly anyone can ask those if they want. But uh, I'd just like to sort of have you guys take the conversation where you would like it to go. Uh, do we have mics going around? Or will people just have to talk yeah. loud? Yeah. We, have, we will have a mic in a second. Um, uh, this Is that a hand or just keeping your? Um, There's also one over there. What? There's also one over there. Or there okay. Was you want to start without the mic with a yeah, loud voice? Yeah. and then, I hear you. Nope, here you go, behind you. My name is Jim Collins. I'm the Jim Collins. Hello? Yeah, there it is. <laughs> My name is Jim Collins. I'm from New York City. I do some work for a statewide advocacy group. I do some volunteer work at the UN. First a comment and then a question. At the UN, they don't talk about entitlements, they don't talk about insurance. The global concept, and I think it would be very helpful, is social protection. It encompasses both social insurance and <coughs> contributory programs like Medicaid and SSI, which are not aren't insurance programs, but it covers everything that protects people against the risk of ill health, death, unemployment, retirement, all of that, social protection. So I sort of encourage people to look at that concept. My question is, and again, I come from New York City, a blue state. We didn't have any, any, con any political ads in me because we are <laughs> not one of the battleground states. Mm. And I rarely see a, a Republican. So my question is today. <laughs> <laughs> David grew up in New York City. Yeah, west side of Manhattan. It was a lonely, it was a lonely couple of years. <laughs> In, in, in one of the uh, presentations today, there was this great graph over 50 years showing productivity versus average or median wages. They parallel for about 50 years to 1978. Then they diverged. Productivity's gone up. Wages haven't. Wages workers haven't been able to keep their share as an impact for social programs, income and all, taxes and everything. What is the Republicans' plan to bring it back, bring it to, to converge again? Is there? No, I mean, I, I think it's the inverse. It's not so much to pull one down, it's to raise the other one up. And, and, part, and part of, the, part of that... Bring them together. Good. Yeah. No, and, and, but, but again, part of that is, is, again, this is the sort of Republican view of, of how do you set all these tax rates so you can maximize economic activity? When you have economic activity and low unemployment, that's when the country is doing its best. And so our viewpoint is, how do you set those rates at, the, at, at that appropriate level? Again, in 70, again, you're dealing with 78, which is like when inflation, there was that whole bizarre dynamic where you had inflation of 78. It's just continued. Right? It's been steady. Right. But, No, but, but, again, but, again, but again, part of that is, is you've had certain things in place, right? Obviously, in terms of regulations, you've had certain things in terms of, of the, the, the deficit and the debt. I mean, you only had this four-year period in terms of Gingrich Clinton in terms of the end of the 90s where actually things were aligned in terms of where the country was actually able to manage its own debt. Um, but ultimately, again, look, I mean, look at the quality of life here in terms of, in terms of Yes, you've seen wages, say, stagnant, but you've also seen the cost of goods in terms of certain things that are available for people to improve. So you've seen some improvement, but what we need to be able to do is not pull things down, but how do you help those individuals grow and give them better opportunity by giving them jobs, getting well, jobs for this country? 
I'm not an economist, but I'm quite certain I probably don't agree with anything that David just said. <laughs> um, so uh, hopefully an economist in the room can tell me why he's wrong. But um, I do think that the divert from what little I you know, read in the you know, economist or whatever, I mean, our economy has changed. The decline of a manufacturing economy, rise of information economy, the, the growing gap between what a college degree gets you and a high school diploma, that's all, that's why productivity has gone up and wages have been stagnant. And obviously, there, it's far beyond tax policy to deal with that. I haven't the slightest idea how we deal with it. Well, but it's, it's a much bigger issue than tax policy or deficits or anything like that. If I can ask, and then there's a question over there. It seems to me you know, that both of you may have downplayed how much economics actually was discussed in the election. I heard a lot of Obama speeches, as you probably did. And it always struck me that the, there was an implicit promise he made, because he cited some of those kinds mm -hmm. of numbers. And it was, I will restore shared growth. Shared growth. Um, and it strikes me that it's a real challenge, not only for the Democratic Party, but actually for center-left parties all across the rich countries in particular, um, that they're having trouble doing that. Well, I mean, I did a big project on inequality and how people think about inequality. And because I think inequality is you know, one of the drivers of the collapse, and it's one of our biggest challenges. And the problem is that there are so many people are struggling that inequality feels like, oh, that's a poor person's problem. Right, and I'm, and so you're, when you talk about inequality, you must be talking about trying to help poor people do better. But I'm really struggling, right, to stay in the middle class. And people are much more focused on the state of the middle class, even though obviously they're, you know, the middle class, <laughs> the growing inequality isn't just, you know, because there are more poor people. It's, you know, it's it's really the education gap. Um, so what you, what, it's not an accident that the way Obama and others started talking about inequality was talking about the middle class and the decline in the middle class and how hard it is to stay in the middle class and how you know people's kids won't you know make as much money as their parents it's because when you talk about that word inequality especially for whites it sort of feels like you're talking about poor people but hey I'm struggling and where are my programs and you know why am I paying for you know to try to make poor people equal and so it's a, it's very difficult and we we didn't find a great rhetorical solution to the problem of how people think about inequality yeah, I, th I recall noticing that the, the language, you know, was started out, you know, we, we can't build the economy from the top down, it has to be bottom up, and then it became middle out uh, for that very reason, rather than bottom up. Uh, there was a hand over here. Um, yes, sir. Um, Hi, thanks. Uh, my name is Brian Collins. I'm with the Bipartisan Policy Center. And uh, I wanted to ask about how do we change the conversation about Medicare away from just about who's going to cut it and how we're going to cut it and devastate it. Because it, there are definitely ways that the program could be improved where it would cost less money and beneficiaries and providers would experience change, like just to throw some ideas out that if you know, we move away from having first dollar supplemental insurance coverage, so some beneficiaries have to pay co-pays when they see the doctor, but maybe we make other changes to the benefit package where there's an out-of-pocket maximum and, and there are other changes, so in some ways people are more protected and overall spending's lower and people may pay more out-of-pocket uh, for visits but may pay lower premiums. So is that a cut or is that a change? Is that a modernization? How do we change the rhetoric so we recognize that a lot of the trade-offs here are actually a lot more complicated and that there are opportunities for a lot of people to be better off with some change. Well, I, I, that goes to the point I made about when we say entitlements are out of control, it's not a helpful conversation in a lot of ways because there are a lot of, and again, I'm no expert on policy, I don't have to be, I just have to test it in a poll. Um, <laughs> but. She my my understanding is there are the lots way. of things, including also fraud, which apparently, as far as I can tell, is a very significant issue in terms of waste, as well as how we, I, I don't want to use the word rationing, but there is an irrational way that we treat a lot of illnesses. And you know there are other countries that ration where the overall health of the nation is better than ours. So there's all kinds of things, it seems to me, that could be done within the program, but we are not having a debate. I know you're asking, how do we do that? And you know. It's very hard to shift a, na a national frame. You need national leadership doing it. And I think our national leadership is accepting the entitlements are out of control frame. 
from from my perspective, the reason is because it's unaffordable at this point. I mean, there's got to be something done if, in fact, we're going to be able to sustain a program and strengthen a program and make it work. And right now, the path it's on is it's not going to work. Having said that, where the public is at doesn't necessarily disagree with you. What Democrats have laid out, people are, are, don't think works for Medicare. At this point, their sense in terms of what Republicans have talked about at this point isn't the answer either. They still think there's another solution out there. What Democrats or Republicans have laid out. I think there's like cuts versus no cuts. It's the only thing that anybody understands. Yeah, I mean, if you want I don't to think take anyone a, I, I, any no, kind of I, plan to deal with Medicare. I, I disagree with that. I mean, I, I think people have a sense of what the scale of the problem is. No, do but they, you said do, people do, disagree they, with the do they, No, do they think, think given what they've heard, do they think Republicans have an answer at this point? I would say the answer, the answer is they're not clear about that. Do they think Democrats have an answer? They're not clear about that. They think there's a need for a deeper, longer discussion that neither party is willing to do because they're so busy winning elections. They're not solving the problem. That may be a perception, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where that, where that gets us. But anyway, okay. uh, go ahead. I'm Fayla Cook at Northwestern University, and I just want to say how wonderful it is to have two public opinion experts talk to us. This evening, especially after the lunchtime talk we had today, in which at one point we were told that some public opinion results were unbelievable, not to be believed. And I have two questions, but first I have to tell you that NASI just finished uh, a very superb, some of us think, uh, public opinion report on Social Security about what the public wants, showing that the public is very supportive of Social Security, which research has shown is true going back to the 1970s from the earliest public opinion polls until now, and also the surveys show that the public is willing to do a lot of things, solutions, as you pointed out, in order to keep Social Security strong, including a number of things that might be surprising. Well, today at lunch, uh, number, Wessel, Those include, as I understand the study, which I just took a quick look at before I come over here, people would pay more in taxes to yes. raise benefits. Yes. That's the preferred yes. solution. Right. Yeah. So David Wessel of the Wall Street Journal, a columnist, says that he's looked at these results, that they are not to be believed, they're unbelievable. So I have two <laughs> questions. My first question is this, as public opinion experts, you must occasionally be told that some of your findings don't seem credible. And I wonder how you deal with that. <laughs> and the second thing <laughs> is that I would like That's us right. to think about, and I would like your advice about how we can get journalists in prominent newspapers, like all of the ones we're well aware of, and like the one that EJ uh, has his column in, how can we get journalists to write about what public opinion really is on Social Security so that we can end some of this scaremongering about Social Security and whether it's going to be there for the younger generation when they retire? Thank you. Good. Well, <clears throat> I actually grew up in New Haven, Connecticut, where the Wessels are from, so I would email his brother and tell him to get his brother, get Dave, I email Bruce to tell David that he has to stop attacking public opinion polls. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what, on what basis he was saying that. There's obviously lots of public opinion that cannot be believed, and there's polls that are deliberately written in ways to produce particular results. More in, there, are, there are more insidious ways that people buy a survey through sample design and other things that, you know, you can do. So it's, I'm not sure why he said that's not believable. If I were to guess, I think what's difficult are hypotheticals about people's willingness to pay taxes. It's very easy to say in a survey, I'd be willing to pay taxes to have universal health insurance, or I'd be willing to do X, Y, or Z. There's no cost to you to say that to a pulse, you know, to the interviewer who's calling you up. But in reality, when it actually happens, or if it's going to happen, things can look quite different, especially if there's an actual campaign about it with, you know, information on both sides. So I believe that what that number, and, and again, I've 
done lots of surveys myself that show that you know 85% of people oppose cutting Social Security to balance the budget. I believe there's incredibly strong support for the program and that people would do a lot to save it, to the degree which you know, it's actually in jeopardy. But I think he's right that it's very easy in the context of a survey to ask a question like that. But when the debates are really joined, it's actually much more challenging to actually, in policy terms, make those kinds of things happen. I don't know if I'm being generous to why he was saying it was not believable, but that's, that's I would, that would be my, if, if you asked me what, would I, what skepticism would I bring to that, that's what I would say. What I would amend in what you said is, it is true that in public opinion surveys, when you tie a tax increase to a very specific benefit that is popular, you do get more support uh, for that tax increase. And when I heard what the survey had found, I was actually not surprised because a lot of people's pensions, you know, pensions except for a very limited number of us are a thing of the past. People at best have their 401ks and the like. Mm -hmm. And after this recession, a lot of people are feeling, uh, more people I suspect are feeling insecure about their retirements. Uh, and so it would not, that, that survey sounded to me perfectly sensible. Like right. you, you, the, it still gets hard once you have a real fight over a real tax increase, uh, that, you know, especially a general tax increase. Um, you know, but but I, I was not surprised when I heard about this survey. And quite a bit here, but I, I want to build one layer on it. And this is the, this is the problem that, that you run into in terms of public opinion research. And let me go back to what I was talking about. People are for across the board spending cuts. Yeah, when I when you identify specific spending cuts, you don't see that. And so what you what you see is people can actually hold conflicting values at the same time. And the hard part of doing doing public opinion research is thinking through how are they going to resolve that conflict of values. And they can be two positive views, or, or two negative views, or, but in this case, you know, they can have two particular positions. How are they actually going to resolve that conflict? And so what he may, what he may have been implying was, well, given, given this other element, you know, that would, that would move. I, may be true, maybe not, but that's what I think you were dealing with. The, um, uh, uh, please, who's got the... Uh... Yeah. Um... Uh, my question was just uh, precluded by the previous questioner, but I'll ask another one. Um, I'm Tom. You can Reagan. ask it again. Tom <laughs> Reagan from uh, the California Alliance for Retired Americans. So we just had an election in California where the people, by an over 55 percent margin, approved uh, a tax increase on the rich and a sales tax increase on everyone, and you know it was because we were facing great cuts in education and programs that affected poor people, that affected seniors, and the people just decided clearly, and I know the demographics of California are different from the rest of the country, but it was clear, uh, the choice was clear, and people voted to tax themselves. So what is it that makes it so difficult in Washington when we have polls like the NASI poll today to uh, listen to the people instead of, is it just the money on the other side? Or what is it that makes it so difficult for Congress to do what people want to do instead of doing what the moneyed interests want to do? Well, I mean, part of it is linked to um, redistricting and polarization, so that over time, Congress has become more ideologically extreme than the public as redistricting in most states, so there's starting to be some changes in different places, including California, have basically been focused on incumbent protection. And so that there are people who study the ADA scores, which is a way of measuring ideology of, of members of Congress, over time. And they've become more and more extreme. But if you look at the general public, you know, people are basically you know, centrist. I won't say center right or center left. So we won't have to have that conversation, but just you know, centrist. Yeah, please, let's not so have that So part of argument. the problem with the, the conversation in, at the federal level is that you've got more and more and more polarization and people who, um, and 98% of incumbents get reelected, so there's absolutely no incentive to have hard political debates. What happens at the state level, you know, people have to govern, right? And so, you know, with some exceptions, I mean, there's some, you know, some governors who are willing to let their states, you know, collapse um, with, because they don't want to, you know, raise taxes or whatever, but, you know, most reasonable governors ultimately have to govern and have to balance their budgets and, and want their state's economy to improve. And so you, there's a little more pragmatism at the, at the state level. And I think you're going to see a bunch of different states where you see, states where you see tax increases. Not just the, this, I mean, um, in, um, in Minnesota, the governor has just introduced his budget that has, 
has a broadening the base of the sales tax but lowering it and tax increases on on the rich and i you know i don't know what's going to happen but i suspect that budget will pass so i think you're going to where you have to actually govern it it's it's you have to be more pragmatic and less ideological you know co congress how when was the last time congress passed a budget or the senate passed i mean you know senate, the senate passed a budget i mean there's like no price for not actually governing in washington could could i just say and I'm, I'm, i want to go to david i think that california there was an enormous clarity uh, uh, in the mind of the voters about what the alternatives were. And Brown made very clear, Governor Brown, what the cuts would have to be. And I think at the local level, at times, it is much easier to raise taxes because people are quite clear on the specific benefits to them, particularly education, transportation, um, where they, will, they know they will feel the cut. And so they can vote for a tax increase as an alternative to that cut. And you have passed tax increases around the country. I don't think people feel the same level of clarity at the federal level. And there's part of me that thinks that the sequester going through might not be, if it stayed, if it, it could have terrible economic effects. But people need to see the trade-off between cuts and, and the need for more revenue, and it's, when you get that, voters uh, some will give contradictory answers. But when things become clear, they tend to make choices. And I think in California, you voters really knew pretty well what the choice they faced. And it was still 55-45, you know. Uh, and I guess, you know, California um, is not Texas, is not Utah, is not New York. Is not, I mean, so, so you're looking at, at specific situations as, as, as they apply. Again, having grown up on the west side of Manhattan, um, I didn't know that there were more than three or four Republicans that existed in the entire universe, right? Um, so, um, but, 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 I but, but I think, again, you, you're getting to, I mean, I think there are gonna be some challenges for California here, and I think one of the things that you're gonna see is what sort of economy can they sustain given what occurred, and that's really gonna be the challenge of the governor. It's not necessarily so much that he just raised taxes, but what is this economy going to look like, and what do people start doing? Do they start walking in terms of deciding there are other areas to live? And I, and I will tell you that that, that that is a real serious problem, and you've, you've seen it happen with France, where you've had some very high-profile people decide to leave the country. And, and I, I'm going to tell you that, they, again, California, if, you, if you're in that upper tier, your tax bracket is now over 50%. Is that, is, that, is, that a, is that a sustainable economic model? I don't know. But I would, su I would suggest to you that it's potentially risky. Am I told that we are, um, we are close to ending? There was one more person who had the mic, so we'll let you have the last word. It seems like for a number of years, oh, sorry, no. we've, we've had a, a fight over, in some ways, the legitimacy of the social insurance programs. I mean, there's been an inability to, to forge compromises because uh, there's been a, a, not an acceptance of the legit legitimacy of the programs. And that may have started all the way back, you know, decades ago with the Leninist memo on how to undermine them. But, um, and it seems like perhaps Citizens United allows that to continue. I'm not sure, but I, I'm just curious, sort of inside the Republican caucus, is there a feeling that maybe that's not the strategy going forward? I mean, it seems like that, that, that strategy hasn't worked so well. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna argue your premise in the sense of no, Republicans do not feel that these, these programs should be brought into question. There is clear support. There's a different concept in terms of what they should look like and how they should, but the idea that they should exist, yes, right? Social Security is something that needs to be there, right? And Republicans support that. Now there's a disagreement in terms of how it works, um, and there's a sense in terms of how you strengthen it and make sure that it's there. Same thing in terms of Medicare. But, but, I, but, I, but I want to I I go to the point that there's, not a, that there's a question of how it should operate and how we make it work um, as opposed to should it exist. And I, and, I, and I think you've seen in some recent discussions where Republicans have taken offense to, to, in terms of the sense that somehow we're questioning Social Security. That is not the case. I know I ran against uh, someone who called Social Security a Ponzi scheme. So I, I think there are certainly elements of the Republican Party who would like to see it go away altogether. It, I'm just no, but, but, but I mean, I, 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 can, I can pick on certain Democratic candidates in terms of like finding well, sort of bizarre statements I'm too. Sorry, your Tea but, Party caucus, I have no doubt, 
is for the elimination of Social Security and Medicare. Okay. And they are a significant power because they are the, you know, the power of no within your party. Well, I want to close I would disagree on with that. <laughs> Um, and and, I, and I, I would suggest that because we just what we just passed um, get, getting the debt ceiling through, right? And and we're about to deal with the sequester. Yeah. We're about to deal with the CR and the budget. And by the way, I'd like to point out, going to your point, you were complaining about a budget. House passed the budget. I know. I, I, I clarified this for the Senate. Right. Um, I, I can't resist closing on the following question. I am feeling unnaturally. Uh, foolishly, maybe even stupidly optimistic uh, for the following reason, uh, for the following set of reasons. Um, it does seem to me that we had two consecutive elections uh, that came out broadly the same way, and that I think there were a lot of substantive issues on the ballot. And Obama's margin wasn't huge, but it wasn't negligible. It was about five million votes. Um, and I think a lot of Republicans have gotten some of that message. I see some real ferment in the Republican Party, you know, particularly not yet a lot out of the mouths of politicians, but they are not the first ones who are going to do this anyway. Um, and then if you look at just the last few months, we did get the Cliff deal, which I still think, whatever its flaws, is not nothing. Uh, we, um, we also, by the way, passed Sandier after the you know, after the resistance. Um, we had, I think, a real step forward on immigration reform uh, this week. Clearly, that discussion is different than it's been since uh, 06. Um, and so my sense is um, the next two and four years will not be, at, at the very least, will not be like the last two years. Uh, and that it is possible that inside your party, David, there will be a rediscovery. We may not bring back her Brownell Republicans, uh, but the, I, I do think there are doubts about the effects of the Tea Party. Um, and then I think President Obama's pursuing a strategy of being much more direct about what he wants as opposed to negotiating with himself, which strikes me uh, there was a point where I would never have let the Obama administration negotiate if I needed a new house or a new car, you know. Have the asking price. Um, you know, they're not there anymore. They're doing this differently. So oh, for all those reasons, I, have, I feel like it's not going to be pretty, but it's going to be better. Now, am I, both of you are free to say I'm crazy. Do you want to say? Um, Can't be any worse. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you? you know, but feel free to undercut any of these premises or maybe add to my optimism. Um, I haven't really thought about it um, because I get, I get very focused on the individual things that I'm working on. And so I tend not to look at the big picture. But I guess, you know, broadly, I guess I would agree with what you've laid out. I just think as you get closer and closer to the 2014 elections, which will be a non-presidential year electorate, and there's more possibilities for the Republicans, it's going to get harder and harder for the Republicans to do things that will in any way, uh, shape, or form be seen as something, an accomplishment for the Democrats or for Obama. So, um, you know, I think, you know, that you, you saw an initial, some cooperation initially in the beginning of 2009 also, right? And then that kind of fell off. So, you know, we'll see. <laughs> David, do you have any thoughts? And, and I guess in particular, the ferment inside your party. No, I, I, again, the, the Tea Party folks are a group of people who are very frustrated by the size of this deficit, right? And truth be told, look, the size is huge. I mean, it's one and a quarter trillion dollars. Again, prior to this president, it had never been larger than $463 billion. So you're talking about a, virtually a 150% increase, right? And they're frustrated by it. And, and they are clearly quite vocal. Having, having said that, um, I think what you're going to see over the next two years is going to be this fight in terms of how does fiscal responsibility, and more importantly, more importantly, how do we get the economic growth um, in this environment? The challenge I would suggest to Republicans in terms of this environment, and this part partially goes to our campaign people, um, um, our campaign folks just simply want to win elections. And I go back to the Cameron, basically sort of paraphrasing David Cameron, who as he sort of revitalized and modern the Conservative Party in, in Great Britain, um, basically said, look, the purpose of a political party is not to win elections, but to prove you're ready to govern. And I think to a large degree that's the challenge, not simply to the Republican Party, but to both parties. Um, it's time to govern. Um, that's what, what people want. There are serious, as you've probably noticed, there are serious di disagreements um, but ultimately, what people want to see is how do you get to point B? And I will tell you that, that it's been a very frustrating experience for the American electorate. 
And on that very high-toned answer, <laughs> I want to thank Anna and David very much.